All right, everyone. Uh, I am Jeff Lewis, and uh, I'm really excited about today's presentation on one of my favorite subjects, California's anti-slap law, slapbacks and smacks. Uh, today, I'm going to be sharing some of my experiences litigating these cases since 1996. And uh, if you have any questions about this presentation, you're welcome to email me at jeff at jefflewislaw.com. And uh, if you uh, are registered for today's webinar, you'll get a copy, a PDF copy of today's presentation. So let's get started. And if you have any questions going along, feel free to put them in the chat and we will try to get to them at the end if we have time. So a little bit about me. I am a 1996 graduate of Loyola Law School. Here's a picture of my team at Jeff Lewis Law APC. I'm a certified appellate specialist by the California State Bar. And I've litigated over two dozen uh, slap matters, handled over 200 appellate proceedings and co-host of the California Appellate Law podcast at calpodcast.com. Today's presentation will have four parts. We're going to talk a little bit about what anti-slap law is in California. We're going to share some best practices for litigators. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some criticisms of the law, and then time permitting, we will wrap up with questions. So let's talk about what problem is trying to be solved by California's anti-slap law. Most litigants who are sued for anything in California, face three to five years of litigation. They face hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees, and they have to uh, respond to invasive discovery requests. It's a very stressful experience. And being a party to litigation is stressful, but in the context of being sued for speaking your mind in a public setting or for petitioning the government for relief, the above problems are uh, particularly problematic. So how do we fix the slap problem? Well, California has what's called an anti-slap law in response to strategic lawsuits against public participation or slap. It's what, the, what gives the First Amendment its teeth without an anti-slap law to say that, well, I have the right of free speech or I can say whatever I want to the United States of America. It doesn't mean anything unless in court you have a procedural mechanism to vindicate that right. And not all states have an anti-slap law. California has one of the more robust ones. And let's go through how the California anti-slap law gives the First Amendment its teeth. Code of Civil Procedure Section 425.16 provides a quick dismissal of certain types of lawsuits that arise from activities protected by the First Amendment. Defendants basically cut the line to the courthouse. Instead of waiting till the end of a case, let's say 30 days before trial, to file a motion for summary judgment after tens of thousands of dollars have already been spent, on um, depositions and discovery. This lets you file a motion to dismiss the case within the first 60 to 90 days of the case. It awards attorney's fees to the defendant if the defendant prevails, and it stays discovery absent an order of good cause. And the loser of the anti-slap ruling has the right of immediate appeal. So those provisions together provide a very powerful weapon against someone who's been uh, sued for speaking their mind. Now, what kinds of cases qualify for anti-slap protection? The courts look at not so much the label of a cause of action, although typically these claims are defamation or malicious prosecution. The courts will look at what activities by the defendant gives rise to the claim. And if those activities are protected by the First Amendment, the anti-slap law is said to apply. So the four big categories of protected activities include statements made in an official proceeding, such as a court hearing or a city council meeting, or statements made in connection with an, indu with an issue under review by such a proceeding, and statements made in a public forum about an issue of public interest, or any other conduct in furtherance of the right of free speech or the right to petition the government. Now let's go over some uh, examples, some easier examples of activities that are protected by the First Amendment. A common example is, let's say a person is gathering signatures in his neighborhood to oppose the development of a shopping center. And after the city, city council votes against the development, suppose that developer sued the signature gatherer for defamation, interference with economic advantage to recover the profits that developer would have made. That's a typical example of a slap. Another common example. Suppose an unhappy customer writes a negative review on Yelp about a bad haircut received at a barbershop. And then the shop owner sues that customer for defamation 
Or suppose a restaurant owner seeks a permit to sell alcohol from the State Alcohol Regulatory Authority, the ABC. That permit is denied, and then the owner sues the people who spoke to the ABC against his permit. That's another example of a case that would fall under the anti slap laws protection. Another common example is a malicious prosecution case. So suppose a defendant in a lawsuit decides to respond to that lawsuit by suing the person who sued him and his lawyer for malicious prosecution or abuse of process. That's an easy example of an anti slap uh, uh, where activities are, will be deemed protected. So let's go over some ter terminology we're going to use today. SLAP stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. It's a meritless suit filed primarily to chill the defendant's exercise of First Amendment rights. An anti-SLAP motion is this procedural device that allows you to cut in the line, go into court, and file instead of an answer or maybe after your answer within the first 60 days of a lawsuit, a motion to dismiss the case. Now, sometimes after a lawsuit is won pursuant to an anti-SLAP motion, it's dismissed, someone will file a second lawsuit, the person who was the defendant and is now a plaintiff, they sue the people that sued them for malicious prosecution, and that is known as a slap back case. So slap is the first case, the anti-slap motion is the, case, is the procedure used to dismiss that first case, and if there is a second case filed, that's a slap back. So suppose in a prior example, if a homeowner were providing a public comment at a city council meeting opposing a big real estate project, and the developer then sued that homeowner based on statements for defamation and interference with contract, and those statements were made during that city council meeting. And let's say that homeowner gets that lawsuit dismissed on First Amendment grounds using the anti-slap law, and then that homeowner decides to file a second lawsuit against the developer for malicious prosecution. In that example, the first lawsuit is a slap. The motion to dismiss that first lawsuit is an anti-slap motion, and the second lawsuit is a slap back. Some more terminology, the cases construing California's anti-slap law usually refer to a prong one or a prong two. Prong one refers to the defendant's initial burden when you uh, file an anti-slap motion to convince the court that the claims asserted against that defendant all arise from protected activity. Once that burden has met under prong one, the burden shifts under prong two to the plaintiff to prove through admissible evidence the minimal merit of the claims using a summary judgment-like standard. One other term we'll talk about today is a smack, a strategic motion against credible claims. Uh, this is a term first coined by Toronto lawyer Asher Honickman on Twitter. And the hallmarks of a smack are basically an anti-slap motion, but there's no clear basis for prong one or it's pretty clear that uh, prong two merits could be easily met. And the purpose of the anti-slap motion is just to drag the case on and uh, avoid or delay engaging discovery. Now, imagine if a fired employee sued his former employer for defamation regarding a private email sent between two people about the employee. And the employer responds by filing an anti-slap motion. And that motion is denied, and the employer appeals, and discovery and pretrial proceedings are delayed by years. That's a pretty clear example of there's no real public issue there. There's no First Amendment activity. This is a smack, an anti slap motion that's been misused to delay proceedings. Now, let's talk about the kinds of cases that do uh, qualify for anti slap protection. Again, only those cases that arise from free speech or government petitioning activity qualify for anti-SLAP protection. Now, although SLAPs are typically filed for the purpose of chilling free speech, there is no intent to chill requirement. So if you have a case where there's no evidence of any intent by the plaintiff to chill free speech, that will not stop you from filing an anti-SLAP motion. And the presence of an intent to chill will not necessarily mean standing alone that a case will be deemed an anti-slap. So let's talk about some of the super easy ones to qualify as a slap. Every time someone is sued for malicious prosecution, that kind of case automatically is entitled to anti-slap protection. Uh, the analysis, the prong one analysis for malicious prosecution, anti-slap motion is usually one sentence citing this case, Jero formulas. Uh, likewise, lawsuits arising from city council members' public statements and votes made during a city council meeting, 
that those are pretty clearly subject to anti-slap protection. Uh, communications made to law enforcement, which might may, uh, might culminate in prosecution or other official proceedings are protected. So you call 911 to report a crime and you get sued for defamation. That kind of communication is usually subject to California's anti-slap law as protected activity. Now, there's some harder ones to classify as a slap. Uh, suppose there's a cross complaint that was filed in retaliation against the plaintiff for filing a complaint. That's not usually protected by anti-slap law, unless the cause of action arises from protected activity. Merely filing a cross complaint against the person who sued a complaint is not alone enough to qualify for anti-slap protection. Let's go over a recent example from last year, Callanan versus Grizzly Designs. There, there was an employee who was burned in a terrible fire uh, at the employer's farm building. This was a marijuana growing farm. And some of the other employees, not Callanan, sued the employer for wage claims. And the employer decided to sue back uh, all the employees who first sued them and dragged Callanan, who was not originally a party to the case, into the case. And Callanan was really upset. He actually had been burned in a terrible fire, and he was upset that his employer had sued him and accused Callanan of starting the fire. So Callanan files a cross complaint against his employer. And what does he say in the cross complaint? Callanan says, well, originally I wasn't going to file a cross complaint, but since you sued me, uh, I, I, um, and because you allege that I intentionally started the fire in the bunkhouse, which burned him severely, he decided to file his own cross complaint against the Menkins. So the question is, is this statement in a pleading where a party says, the only reason I sued you is you sued me first. Is that enough to qualify the case for anti-slap protection? Keep in mind, all of Callanan's claims were wage claims. They were uh, not based on being wrongfully sued, but based on not being given a pay stub and not being paid appropriate overtime and those kinds of claims. The trial court ruled that this was an anti-slap uh, or this was protected activity and dismissed Callanan's cross complaint. All of his wage claims were dismissed. And up on appeal, the court of appeal, initially in an unpublished decision, later published decision, reversed and found that the injury producing conduct was not the employer's filing of the cross complaint against Callanan. Instead, it was the failure to comply with wage and hour laws and other actions taken as an employer that uh, was the basis for Callanan's claims. And because of that, the anti-slap motion was held to be improperly granted. So it's very important in the context of complaints and cross complaints and complex litigation to analyze what truly is the conduct that gives rise to the claims and don't get distracted by uh, statements of intent Let's talk about some harder ones to qualify as anti-slap. Uh, a claim arising from a state bar fee arbitration is protected activity. So when there's a fee dispute between a lawyer and a client, the state requires you to offer fee, uh, uh, low cost fee arbitration to resolve the dispute. And some sort of claim arises from that arbitration, say malicious prosecution or abuse of process, that type of claim is subject to anti-slap protection. Oddly enough, contractual arbitration is not a judicial proceeding, and it's not a protected activity within the meaning of California's anti-slap law. So activities occurring in the context of contractual arbitration will not give rise to an anti-slap um, motion if you're sued for something that happens during contractual arbitration. Uh, on the other hand, activities that occur in the context of a HOA dispute over tree trimming is enough of an official proceeding to qualify as protected activity, and someone sued in that context will have an anti-slap as a remedy. Uh, another key area of protection for California's anti-slap law relates to news gathering and news reporting. Uh, in Lieberman versus KCOP television, a lawsuit against a television network based on news gallery activity was held to be protected by California's anti-slap law. California cases have broadly defined news gathering activity and news reporting, and it is very difficult to argue prong one doesn't apply 
when you have a media defendant, let's say for defamation based on a broadcast. Now, let's talk about statements made in a public forum about an issue of public interest. Older cases, when the anti slap law was first passed, pretty broadly held that if you had a website and it discussed a public issue, those kinds of uh, activities were protected by the anti slap law. And so you have cases involving, let's say, Yelp or message boards about securities. Those cases, those older cases, talk about how a defamation or an interference with contract claim arising from statements made on an online uh, uh, forum like Yelp or uh, uh, any other kind of electronic bulletin board normally qualifies for anti-slap protection. But more recently, say in the last five years, courts have kind of pulled back a little bit, not on the requirement that websites are public forums. I think most courts will hold that if you put a website up, that is a public forum. But they're tightening the definition of public interest, and it's harder these days to prove to the court that statements made in a public forum actually pertain to an issue of public interest. Let's talk about the case of the bad birthday cake. Here was a case where a social influencer uh, had a birthday party coming up for his seven-year-old, and he arrived a specially made cake, and it was going to be based on a TV show or a cartoon, but when the cake arrived, it was covered with looked like pills, medications. And then the person who ordered the birthday cake, the social influencer, thought it was inappropriate for a little kid's cake to look like it had pills on it. And here's a picture of that uh, birthday cake. So plaintiff was unhappy, happened to be a social media influencer. Guess what he did next? He goes online. He says, you effed up royally. Now you guys are canceled. You effed up my son's birthday cake. I'll make sure nobody knows, nobody I know or who knows me ever does business with idiots such as your business. And he says, anyone in their even high mind would know that you should never, ever put drugs on a seven-year-old kid's birthday cake. So that's what he said all over social media. And the, uh, the cake company ended up suing the social influencer for defamation. And the social influencer decided to bring an anti-slap motion saying, hey, it was a public statement made in a public forum and it's an issue of public interest. Don't we want to protect kids from drugs? Isn't that a legitimate public interest? Ultimately, the Court of Appeals said no. Uh, these are not statements made in an official proceeding. They are not statements made in connection with an official proceeding. They were made in a public forum. So online review sites such as Yelp and uh, social influencers uh, posts on Twitter and Facebook are statements made in a public forum. But what about this issue of public interest? Is a dispute over a bad birthday cake a matter of public interest? The Court of Appeals said, look, this dealt with one transaction. The dispute over pills on this birthday cake was not part of a larger discussion about bakeries or or." children's safety. And this was not intended uh, to really further a conversation about safety. Instead, it was intended to gather ammunition for more controversy. And so at the end of the day, the Court of Appeal found that the anti-slap motion does not apply, the anti-slap law does not apply, and the case could go forward. The lesson from that case is when you are handling, either making or opposing an anti-slap motion involving the public forum uh, category of protected activity, you want to make sure you don't rely on some of the older cases that broadly define public interest, or just be aware that newer cases define public interest in a narrower fashion. Let's talk about some important exemptions to California's anti-slap law. There's three big exemptions, meaning a case that would otherwise be entitled to First Amendment protection and an anti-slap law are exempt and such defendants cannot bring an anti-slap motion in certain categories that are exempt. So the first of these exemptions we're going to talk about involves a plaintiff's lawyer writing a letter to a potential defendant who's a celebrity, he's an entertainer, and plaintiff's counsel accuses the entertainer of rape, and he urges the entertainer to contact his insurance carrier to settle this case. 
the plaintiff's lawyer warns that plaintiff has already retained forensic expert witnesses whose opinion shall be disclosed in detail in publicly filed court documents. And the plaintiff's lawyer threatens investigation of the entertainer's private assets and to make them public. And the plaintiff's lawyer says, any and all information, including immigration, social security issuances and use, and IRS and various stat, state tax levies and information will be exposed. And we are positive the media worldwide will enjoy what they find. And the plaintiff's lawyer says, all pertinent information and documentation shall immediately be turned over to any and all appropriate authorities. The entertainer then filed a lawsuit against the plaintiff and plaintiff's counsel for extortion and other torts. And the plaintiff responded, hey, it's an anti-slap motion. Uh, act, uh, communications in advance of a lawsuit are protected by law uh, under Civil Code Section 47, and therefore the anti-slap motion should be granted and this case should be dismissed. Ultimately, the California Supreme Court weighed in and carved out a new exemption here held that the anti-slap law does not apply to conduct, which is indisputably illegal. You, know, you get 100 lawyers in a room, they would all agree that some of these uh, statements were over the top, the threats were over the top. It wasn't just pre-litigation settlement banter. This was extortion. And the case is Flatley versus Morrow. It's a 2006 case. I bring it up because it's an important exemption, but it is frequently invoked but rarely applies. And the reason it rarely applies is the conduct in question has to be indisputably illegal. And oftentimes when a plaintiff files a case, they believe the other side has acted improperly or illegal, but it is the rare case that uh, the parties stipulate that the conduct was illegal or that 100 lawyers or 100 judges looking at these set of facts would all agree it is indisputably illegal. But if the Flatley v. Maro exemption for illegal conduct applies, that defendant is out of luck, has to litigate the case in the normal way, and cannot file an anti-slap motion. Let's talk about a second exemption or second of three exemption. That's for commercial speech. The anti-slap law does not apply against businesses making statements of fact about that business or about its competitors, and the intended audience is customers. So let's say there's a defendant who has made online statements about his product or his competitor's products, and he's sued for defamation. That type of defendant, because it is commercial speech, it's considered exempt and cannot bring an anti-slap motion. And let's talk about the third type of exemption uh, for anti-slap motions, and that's for public interest lawsuits. Uh, the anti-slap law does not apply to lawsuits that are brought solely in the public interest, where the plaintiff seeks no greater relief than that for the general public, that the action would enforce an important right affecting the public interest, and where private enforcement is necessary. If you meet all those qualifications, such a defendant cannot bring an anti-slap motion. Now, let's talk about exemptions to the exemptions or exceptions to the exemptions. The commercial speech and public interest exemptions that I just reviewed do not apply in the context of actions that arise from the creation or publication of creative works, news, music, TV, nor do they apply to nonprofit organization defendants who receive more than 50% of their revenue from grants, awards, et cetera. So to recap these three exemptions and the best practice to analyze these issues, whether you're internally analyzing it or how you organize your brief when one of these exemptions potentially applies, either illegality, commercial speech, or public interest law, I think the best practice is to analyze the exemptions issues first before your prong one analysis. And if any of these three exemptions apply, invite the court to deny the anti-slap motion as inapplicable. Otherwise, proceed to prong one and prong two. All right, I want to share, I think I've got 10 tips and traps to avoid for litigating uh, some prong one issues. First, be aware that section 42516, which talks about activities protected by the First Amendment and subject to California's anti-slap law, and civil code section 47, which deals with the privilege provided to lawyers and other participants for activities involving court and other official proceedings. They're similar, but they're not identical. 
and statements that may be protected by the litigation privilege of Section 47 are not necessarily protected activity within the meaning of the anti-SLAPP law. Second point, in determining the prong one issue, is this an act activity that's protected by the First Amendment and subject to California's anti-SLAPP law? The courts will look to the pleadings and evidence uh, the label of the form, or excuse me, the label of the form of cause of action is not determinative. So it doesn't have to be labeled a defamation claim. It doesn't have to be labeled an interference with contract claim or malicious prosecution claim. If the activity the defendant is alleged to have engaged in that gives rise to the lawsuit is protected by the First Amendment, that is the key. And as we discussed earlier, there is no intent to chill requirement. So you have great evidence like in the Calinan case that the person who filed a case is motivated uh, to punish someone for exercising First Amendment activities. That fact alone is not enough to warrant anti-slap protection. And that fact standing um, on its own is uh, essentially irrelevant to the anti-slap analysis. The other thing to keep in mind when litigating these cases is not all federal courts apply anti-SLAPP laws. Now, the Ninth Circuit generally does so, although there's been some uh, grumbling within the Ninth Circuit about how maybe they should revisit that issue. But a lot of other circuits do not apply state anti-SLAPP laws. Also, keep in mind, there's no right to file an anti-SLAPP motion in limited jurisdiction cases. So you'll often find savvy plaintiffs file a defamation case in a limited jurisdiction case. And a defendant there, unless they can think of a way to transfer the case to unlimited court, there's no anti-slap option. An interesting thing involving the interplay of appeals and anti-slap motions. When a court has determined that the commercial speech or public interest exemption applies, there is no right of immediate appeal, meaning the loser of the anti-slap has to wait until the very end of the case, a judgment before seeking review of that anti-slap decision. And likewise, if this is the second lawsuit where you have a first lawsuit, which was a slap, and that person who was sued won, and then they turn around and sue the people that sued them for a malicious prosecution, and you have a slap back, in a slap back case, the person who is sued in that slap back, the former plaintiffs actually have the right to file a modified anti-slap motion. But one of the big modifications are they're not entitled to an award of attorney's fees and they don't have the right of an immediate appeal. If they lose that anti-slap, they have to wait till the, uh, to get review at the end of the case from the judgment. Putting those exceptions aside, so for commercial speech, public interest, or slap backs, all other orders granting an anti-slap are immediately appealable. And if you don't appeal, you waive your right to review. Also on a related point, an anti-slap motion order is a case killing um, order. It terminates the case, it's effectively a judgment. And for this reason, there's no right to file a motion for reconsideration of an anti-slap order. Sometimes you'll feel find that people will file a motion for reconsideration of an anti-slap motion as a way to try to extend the time to appeal. But the time only gets extended to appeal if a valid motion for reconsideration is filed. And there is no such thing as a valid motion for reconsideration of an anti-slap order. There's a case in 2020 called Marshall v. Webster for that point. All right. Now, the first, we've just talked about some of the prong one issues, the first determination um, as to whether or not the activities that give rise to the lawsuit are protected by the First Amendment. Now we're going to shift a little bit to prong two and talk about uh, whether a plaintiff can establish a prima facie case. Now, before getting to the evidence, the court is required to review the adequacy of the pleading. And if the pleading fails under a demur-like standard, the court doesn't even need to reach the evidence. So if you have a deficient pleading, let's say that fails to plead a specific element or discloses that the statute of limitations applies, you don't even need to present evidence, although it's risky, you could uh, rest solely on the pleadings. And there's an Anschutz Entertainment Group versus SNEP case from 2009 that stands for that proposition. Now, after the court evaluates the pleadings, the court then turns to the evidence 
in, uh, offered in opposition to the anti-slap motion. And the court has to only consider competent and admissible evidence in evaluating whether or not the plaintiff has established a probability of prevailing. It is a pretty low, lenient standard summary judgment-like where evidence is not weighed, credibility is not weighed, and the only question is whether there's a prima facie case established. Now, once the anti-slap motion is filed, and this is especially true where there is a defective pleading, a plaintiff cannot thereafter amend his complaint. Uh, the court uh, should limit its examination to the existing pleading and ignore any attempts to amend the pleading to cure the deficiencies. And you can take a look at the Jackson v. Mayweather case. Now, some common arguments that are raised in defamation cases in the context of anti-slap motions filed by defendants uh, to try to get the case dismissed on an anti-slap are the litigation privilege of Civil Code Section 47, the common interest privilege of Civil Code Section 47 and common law, truth, whether or not the statements are opinion or fact, if you have a case involving a public figure or a limited public figure, whether or not there's evidence of actual malice under the New York Times versus Sullivan test, statute of limitations, and single publication rule. You'll often see these defenses asserted in a defamation case involving uh, anti-slap issues. Similarly, in a case involving malicious prosecution, when the defendant brings an anti-slap motion, you'll see uh, assertion of litigation privilege, advice of counsel, statute of limitations, whether or not there was probable cause, whether or not there was a favorable termination, and whether or not the prior plaintiffs acted with malice in bringing the prior action. Those issues are frequently asserted in the context of an anti-slap motion to dismiss a malicious prosecution case. Now, sometimes a slap becomes a smack, a strategic motion against credible claims. When a case is bogged down for years with a slap and then one or more appeals, and the only deterrent to frivolous anti-slap motions and appeals are sanctions motions, which are not frequently granted. And even when fees are granted, the delay and reduction in plaintiff's resources may achieve the defendant's illegitimate goals. Now, I think the answer or the solution to uh, some slaps becoming smacks is the court should find that any time a trial court finds that an anti-slap motion is frivolous, that um, the, the defendant, the moving party, should be entitled to attorney's fees for having to defend the anti-slap motion, that type of um, ruling renders the anti-slap unappealable immediately. They have to wait till the end of the case. I think that would cure one of these issues in terms of smacks being used improperly to delay otherwise legitimate claims. Well, that presentation went faster than I thought. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And if not, we're going to conclude and we will uh, send a copy, a PDF of this presentation. Oh, and the first person to email me, Jeff, I want a podcast mug. I will send you one of our patented copyright California appellate law podcast mugs. Email me at jeff at Jeff Lewis Law and tell me you want a podcast mug. The first person who emails me will get a podcast mug. And it looks like I don't see that we have any questions. So thank you all for coming today. And uh, if you have any uh, questions or needs uh, regarding anti-slap law, contact me at jeff at jefflewislaw.com.